language. These were historic words. Victory in Europe. In Palestine, they meant more than victory. They meant that the desperate remnant of their massacred millions would be saved. And they meant that their own men would come home. It was long ago, two whole years ago, that the people of Palestine celebrated the end of horror and the beginning of hope. They had done their share. 30,000 Palestine Jews had answered the call to arms, knowing this was irrevocably and urgently their war. Under the leadership of the Jewish agency, these volunteers learned in Palestine the arts and hazards of a battle which they were soon to join, fighting not only for their own survival, but for that of their whole people. Their faith sustained them. So did the leaders who had brought them so far. Chaim Feitzman, their tireless friend and guardian, watching with a father's pride the new young army of Palestine. Moshe Shertok, impassioned spokesman for their cause. With them marched the prayers of their people who knew what their stalwart sons and daughters, sisters and brothers were fighting for. In the hills of Italy, the Jewish brigade looked like any other allied infantry group, a bunch of hot and weary men heading for the enemy. But they were not only there to fight. Every man in the brigade was an ambassador of hope to the Jewish community, an envoy from a land where Jews were welcomed a symbol of what Jews can become when they are free and wanted. Those who did not die lived for their people, parachuting with aid and relief into Axis territory, organizing schools and welfare centers on their leaves. They were men of reconstruction as well as men of war. Their courage, their zeal, their skill were common knowledge to the British who trained them and to the Germans who confronted them. Each shell was forged in their soul. But Palestine did not only give men. It poured resources into the Allied struggle. With Rommel and El Alamein and the whole Middle East cut off, Palestine was forced to produce overnight the needs of armies. 1,800 factories sprung up during the war. And the value of their output amounted to $180 million dollars. In the laboratories, invaluable contributions were made by scientists like Miss Weitzmann and her famous brother, especially in the use of the Dead Sea mineral yield of potash and magnesium for war needs. The oil refineries of Haifa held the key to Middle Eastern fate as the central transmission point of oil piped from Iraq. And while they fed the machines of war, Palestinian grain fed men who would otherwise have been cut off from food by the Mediterranean blockade. Palestine shipping suddenly achieved a scope and prominence that augured a maritime future for a tiny country that had only just begun to exploit its natural assets of sea coast and sea ferries. All this helped to win the war, long ago in 1945. But underlying the gratitude for victory that night in Tel Aviv was a much deeper gratitude for this Jewish home, wrested from the desert by the same hands and hearts that had labored so passionately for peace and for a better world. This labor is a living legend. So long as there is a Jew in Palestine, it will go on. And the more Jews there are in Palestine, the more will the desert yield, returning to life, with land bought by the Jewish National Fund, with tools and equipment supplied by the Palestine Foundation Fund, and with a program directed and administered by the Jewish Agency for Palestine, this heroic work of reclamation restores to the soil the fertility which was its rightful inheritance and which only inertia and neglect had denied it. First of all needs 
was water. Without water, there is no life. Without water, there is no civilization. Without water, there is no power. And without power, no community can produce for itself and for others the tools and treasures of a modern culture. First of all, new settlers in Palestine must know how to handle these tools in their most elementary use, the cultivation of the soil. Through the work of agricultural schools, the Jewish agency is fitting these immigrants into a diversified farm economy, in which each individual will have his task, and in which each task will be integrated with the life of the community. This is the core of Jewish-Palestine transformation of a homeless, rootless people into self-supporting citizens, intimate with all forms of living and growing things. This is a far cry from ghettos, from massacre, from despair. And these young settlers, competing at a harvesting contest, know whether they win or lose that they are reaping their own future. They and their kind are pioneers in a new kind of life, the communal settlements of Palestine, springing up all over on land provided by the Jewish National Fund, like vital oases. Here is an ordered, frugal, and fruitful pattern of existence. Self-governed, self-sufficient, and self-imposed, it is a world in which each member works not only for himself, but for the whole, secure in the knowledge that he is building for a common goal. There is no waste here. With duties assigned to all, every human being is wanted, every human being is valuable. In this assurance alone, the immigrant begins to realize what it means to belong. Children are the concern of the whole community. And every possible thing is done to allow their development into a healthy and confident breed, free from the warping shadows of the past. The young people of Palestine are living evidence that this has already been achieved. They have emerged literally from darkness into light. Like seeds nurtured in the cellars of Europe, they are now flowering in the sun, growing through the benevolence of air and water and freedom into strong and beautiful plants. They and the new yield of the Palestine earth are celebrated by immemorial custom at the harvesting festival, the Sukkot, season of fulfillment. The Jews have made Palestine a fruitful and abundant land. Only citrus production was set back severely during the war through lack of export possibilities. But now the citrus industry, for which Palestine is famous, is back into full swing, as it must be to help provide a half-starved world with essential vitamins. Palestine is one of the largest orange exporters in the world. Groves can be made to spring from apparently barren soil, providing work and livelihood for thousands to come. Since the expansion of Palestine's absorptive capacity depends largely on her industrialization, the Jewish agency spurs the rapid reconversion of war industries and the growth of new ones, geared to meet peacetime needs. Ten 
new textile mills have recently been set up. The clothing industry has begun to flourish. The leather industry now employs a thousand people as against a hundred of pre-war days. are processed into soap and also refined into oil. Food canning, perfected during the war, is at an all-time high. Palestine has become one of the major diamond cutting centers, jumping from four to 34 factories and still expanding. agency has been the prime stimulating force underlying Palestine's fishing and shipping industry. One of its most important steps has been the inauguration of the Kedem Palestine Line. The Mediterranean, ancient mother of civilization, is now yielding light for the people of modern Palestine. Nine fish canning factories now process the yield of the sea. Like everywhere else in this chaotic world, Palestine faces a housing shortage. Doubly acute because of the urgent needs of new immigrants. In agricultural settlements, 10,000 rooms have been built for them in the last three years. But the cities, too, must be ready to absorb the increasing population. Tel Aviv is already 200,000 strong. But this all-Jewish city, built entirely by Jews, must expand even further. So must Haifa. And so must Jerusalem. Forty years ago, sand dunes covered the site of shining Tel Aviv. Today, Tel Aviv is the center of Eastern Mediterranean civilization. Tel Aviv has all the techniques of a modern community in a country which used to depend, before the Jews returned, on the most primitive forms of communication. Here is the nerd center of a city whose multi-origined inhabitants have created a cosmopolitan world of their own. One of the proudest achievements of Palestine are its magnificent hospitals. The doctors who staff them have been Europe's loss, but Palestine's gain. Nowhere is the training of nurses more thorough and up-to-date. And nowhere is the work of Jewish doctors given more scope and finer equipment. The school system of Palestine is another triumph of planning and has set a standard of education which may alarm the enemies of human progress, but which should raise immeasurably the whole intellectual and moral texture of the Middle East. There is nothing new about Hebrew culture. But there is something new in the freedom and dignity of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, staffed by the most brilliant intellects, and those who seek knowledge find it here, and with it an overwhelming impetus towards using that knowledge for a fuller life. Here the marriage of science and the humanities finds complete expression. Music flows in the Jewish bloodstream and the outcasts of Europe have found in Palestine the perfect setting and atmosphere for their high talents. Music and festivity. These are the brighter sides of an existence that sometimes seems like an obstacle race full of frustration and bitterness. But the mere fact of living on Palestinian soil is reason enough for celebration. A kind of joy which, because it is Jewish, always has a deep undercurrent of faith. 
In the Hanukkah candlelight celebration, the Jews of Palestine reaffirm this faith. The coming of spring in Palestine is another reaffirmation. Not only of the immortality of the soil, but of the hope which flourishes in this particular corner of earth. Palestine is beautiful, and the broad stretches of land and shore seem to say, there is room for all, old and young, who belong here. Palestine is waiting for its people, eagerly, with arms outstretched, with work at hand, with all its will and resources. 26,000 Jews arrived last year. At least that number will come again this year. As they come, settlements must spring up to house them, and they must be made as ready for the land as the land is ready for them. Nothing can stop this return to life, as nothing stopped the settlement in the Negev at night and swiftly. This is what the hounded, exhausted tens of thousands have come for the right to live, the right to build, the right to create life, and the right to guard it till it comes to fruition and security. This is the return to origins, to faith, to freedom. At least this is what the desperate and homeless think as their leaking, miserable ships approach the land of promise. These are happy people, these remnants of a massacred race. They are happy because the end is in sight, the end of terror, the end of persecution, the end of barbed wire. To young, to old, to sick and to well... To those maimed and mutilated by memories and acts of horror, this is the beginning of hope, the end of barbed wire. Maybe, and maybe not. thousands, the barbed wire is still there, holding them back from their fulfillment of their dream. Back they go, herded again, helpless, to the no-man's land of Cyprus. Within sight of the blessed free shores, they are caged, as they have been caged for innumerable years in the ghettos of Europe. But it is too late to stop them now. And there is no fence high enough to halt this dream and this reality. They will come back. They are coming back. And Palestine is ready for them. Ready to house them. Ready to teach them. Ready to rehabilitate them. A reality. To make these people belong at long last. The country and the cities of Palestine are waiting for them, waiting for their hands, their spirit and their will to return this land to life and their own life to themselves. This is their future. This is their last best hope. It is up to you to see that it comes to pass. It is up to you to create this new life. It is up to you to see that the children of Palestine are children of the sun, whole and unafraid, free to fulfill the wonderful destiny for which their fathers have struggled since time began. Mm-hmm.